Welcome into a Saturday edition of the Sunday Side Session. I'm Mike Schaefer, joined by the host of Big Red Wrap Up and the executive director of the Jet Award Foundation, Michael Severe, joining us here on Saturday morning to recap Nebraska's 31-24 loss to Illinois that featured the continuation of many concerning trends. Most notably, the eighth straight game in which Nebraska does not score in overtime, which is just absurd. Uh, I don't (laughs) think they have a first down in those eight overtimes either, which is also absurd. We can dive into that, or we can just mostly talk about what went wrong for Nebraska on Friday. Michael, how are you this this Saturday morning? Uh, I'm doing well. Shafe, and it truly is. It's the curse of Bo Pelini, right? I mean, Bo Pelini's last game, Kenny Bell makes that catch in the corner of the end zone. They beat Iowa. Next day, they fire Bo Pelini. And since then, Nebraska's not had a first down in overtime. It, it, it goes it goes straight back to Bo Pelini. It feels like it, at least. Yeah, it really yeah. does. It really does. So, Friday night, I mean, Nebraska's up 17-10. Or, yeah, 17-10 going into the second half. It really felt like they had seized control of that game at the end of the second quarter. They get a stop to start the second half. They have an opportunity to add to that lead. Pretty much one play for a first down and then a three and out. Illinois ties it up. What what were your thoughts sort of as we're at that point midway through the third? How are you feeling about Nebraska at that point? What did you see in that game? I didn't feel as good about Nebraska's first half. You kind of said they took control, but remember, there was a really bad drop that happened in the second quarter to stop a drive for Illinois. Um, there was another couple of plays that they just barely missed, and I thought we started seeing that their running backs were picking up a little bit more mo- momentum. We already saw that the wide receivers weren't a great matchup for Nebraska. Um, they do a stat in, in the NFL where they talk about separation yardage, and I don't know how many times you saw, even in the first half, where Altmaier made throws and there was no one in the picture or there was no one within four yards of wide receivers, and that's scary. And you know guys are going to get tired as the game goes on, and so that's going to get worse and worse. So I didn't feel as good as halftime. It was great that they had that Nebraska had the lead, but I felt that maybe Illinois had outplayed them a little bit. And then in the third quarter – Nebraska's offense, actually, when you look at some of the numbers and look what they did, I was, I was kind of impressed with a freshman quarterback who's got his back up against the wall a little bit, making some plays. But there's no excuse, Schaefer, what happened on the run game in that last, say, 20 minutes of the game. There were too many times where there was nobody in the hole. There was guys getting open. There were tw- 21, 21-yard 21 runs by two different backs. That that just can't happen in the second half. Not, not, in, not against a defense that wants to be top 10, that talks about being top 10. That can't happen. You just cannot let those kind of runs happen. And you can't let Altmaier get out of the pocket, which we knew was a key coming in. It was just like Mordecai against Wisconsin last year. You have to make sure you keep those kind of quarterbacks in the pocket because they'll get enough to make it hard for you on third down or even fourth down challenges. Yeah, it it felt like Nebraska too often last night was caught in between where they didn't know if they could send extra pressure. And when I max protect or felt like they max yeah. protect the entire game. And I, I, I'm at a loss sometimes for how often Nebraska's corners play off coverage. I mean, you're talking about some of that space. Some of it is just what they gave Illinois. I mean, the amount of times in which they're sitting seven yards off on the route, and it's a quick, easy throw for Altmaier. I mean, it, it, if you're not getting pressure with four, right. and if you're playing off coverage, you're sort of leaving it kind of easy for the quarterback to pick his spots and and to pick apart what you're doing. So I think they they struggled in that regard. The run game, though, I don't really – I don't know how Nebraska goes about fixing that. I apologize again for, like, the fifth show in a row. My voice is going <laughs> to be touch and go. At some point, mm-hmm. I will be over this cold. I don't know when. Trust me, I want to <laughs> pass it more than you do. But um, – yeah. Hey, going back real quick, we were talking about yeah, you, 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 can, you can only – so this goes back to my old coaches. Cousin, Kevin Cosgrove had, had this had this idea where if if you eat, you eat one of the two, either you're going to press guys and you're going to bring your safeties, you leave your safeties back, and, and you're going to stop them from getting open, uh, just basically the wide receivers getting open, or you're going to put a ton of pressure and then you're going to set off in coverage and you're going to let them go down the field but take like 9, 10, 11 you know, plays to do it. 
I don't believe you can do that anymore. I, I think quarterbacks are too good. I think wide receivers are too good. Overall, teams are just too good to do that anymore. So I think you, the first one has to happen. You've got to press guys. You've got to say, if you're going to beat me man to man, you're going to beat me. And my ends and my defensive line is going to get to you before you can make that throw. Nebraska didn't do either one of those. They didn't get enough pressure, obviously. Altmaier stood back there a number of times with all kinds of time. And then at the same time, the wide receivers were open because they were playing off coverage. you got to make a choice, man. You, can, you can't let them have both things. And on top of it, like I mentioned, you can't let them run the ball, too. So all the things that Nebraska did. And, and I, look, Illinois is a good team. Let, let's, let's give Altmaier credit. Let's give the offensive coordinator credit for some of the plays he called. It was great. It's a great game plan. But at the same time, we expect Nebraska to be at least the top 25 defense, at least the top half of the Big Ten. And that's not what we saw last night. Yeah, no, I, I agree with everything you said right at the end there. I mean, Illinois was better than I thought they would be. Their offensive coordinator had a nice job of keeping Nebraska off balance, but it just felt like they were just continually caught in between. I, and not to, to pick on anybody in a, a night where the defense failed on every level, mm -hmm. the safety position really, really, yeah. really struggled. I mean, every play action, someone was getting caught in the backfield just looking at the quarterback or not mm -hmm. following the guy that he's supposed to be covering. The run fits from the safeties were not strong throughout the game. I, You know, that was an area of the team where I think Nebraska feels like they have an advantage. And Deshaun Singleton didn't play well. I don't think that Isaac Gifford played well. Uh, Malcolm Hartzog didn't play well. It was it was a little surprising how poor it was uh, from, from an area where I think Nebraska really feels like they have a strength on their defense. I think Deshaun Singleton played well in what he does well. He's a good tackler. He's good at coming in the box. A guy that size, I don't know if we can expect him to be the best in terms of pass coverage, but even Buford had moments where he didn't um, follow his wide receiver very well, didn't make plays. Hartzog had a ridiculous face mask at the end of a play that made no sense. The guy's being tackled. He reaches out and just grabs his face mask. I don't know why he did that. Um, but yeah, overall, the second year, Tommy Hill obviously goes out early with his plantar fasciitis and um, Sierra Wright made a couple of plays, but that secondary is as good as that defensive front six is, right? Those three guys up front, those three linebackers, whoever's coming after the quarterback, if they're not going to get pressure, the secondary is going to struggle. And we saw that yesterday. Um, but, but more than that, <laughs> again, they gave up 5.5 yards a carry on first down. There's, yeah. it's, they're lucky they got the overtime. Those are the kind of stats where the, you have a success rate that's in the 80% in terms of first down. You're normally – you're going to give that up. You're only going to lose the game. Um, they lost the game, but they got an overtime. So I got to give the defense some credit for coming up and making some big plays late, you know, getting that, that late stop to force the punt and, and doing something. So they did some – they had some moments. But if you go and you look at the advanced stats, you're like, wow, how did, how did Nebraska even stay in this game with some of the things that Illinois did on the ground and, and then late in the air? Yeah, I mean, comparatively, Illinois was sitting in second and medium or third and, and short relative to Nebraska, who felt like they were second and long uh, yep. a fair amount. And then, you know, they converted several third downs where you just don't expect Nebraska teams in the past, unless it's the, uh, we're going to pretend to throw, and then Adrian just runs it. Like, that was their yeah. most successful yeah. third and long play for about a four-year stretch there. And now they actually have the, uh, an offense that can move it through the air. Let's, let's, let's go with that. Let's switch over to the offensive side of the ball. Yeah. I, you've been watching football a long time. You've been watching college football a long time. I just kind of want to give you the floor to talk about Dylan Raiola, even in a loss last night. And I know there's a, the play to Luke Lindemeyer, you know, that, that will happen. I thought Dylan Raiola was fantastic last night. Even the interception didn't even feel like that was a, a mistro or anything that, that should have been on him. I'm still not even entirely convinced it could have been an interception. Uh, but Dylan Raiola was incredible as a true freshman last night. So I just want to give you the opportunity to uh, to say whatever you would like about Dylan Raiola. Yeah, I thought I thought at times he looked a freshman. There were there were some plays where he did some things where I thought, okay, freshmen are going to make those kind of mistakes in terms of not having both hands on the ball in the pocket. If you're climbing the pocket, both hands they they train those guys. I, you see it in practice. Put both hands on the ball, and so he had those two fumbles back to back on the one drive. The the interception. I actually thought either that was going to be a touchdown or it was going to be incomplete pass. Right. So I actually thought the ball fell between the two, the, the cornerback and and the wide receiver. So I thought it actually was going to be incomplete, and then. The amount, the, the amount of time that the wide receiver had the ball 
and had one foot down in the end zone. Usually that's a that's a touchdown most times, but that's twice now that he's had interception interception that shouldn't be interceptions. What you're talking about and in terms of his poise and making plays, especially off balance um, or off platform, it's amazing. He he made a throw. Um, I want to say it was in the third quarter. Um, they go were they going south in the third quarter? Were they going to a south stadium? Yeah, they were going to the south. Okay, though. yeah. Are you talking third about quarter. the first throw of the of the second half where he just dropped it in for the twenty nine yarder? That's a great one. But this is one where he's off. He's kind of off balance and he's going to his left and he just flicks the ball. And, and the amount of times he flicks the ball where he is just kind of off balance and it gets to the wide receiver blows my mind. Um, he made a couple throws uh, when they show the, the end zone version of it where there was no path there. And, and he still put the ball in um, and, and it was for first down. So, yeah, his poise is incredible. The off platform plays are incredible. Um, the throw to Lyndon Meyer, I, you could tell it haunted him. They didn't show it on TV because I rewatched some of it today. Um, you, you could see it on the field. He went down with his, kind of his knees, but like in a squat position with his head down, with his hands over, knowing that that really, I mean, maybe it wins the game for you. If nothing else, it puts you in a situation where you can't lose the game. And it, it hurt him. And it's, it's, it's a tough play. And it's going to happen sometime. But you're right. Overall, his poise is able to put the ball in spots where no quarterback that Nebraska's had in a generation to do is, is pretty amazing. And I also think we don't give him enough credit for him at times. It seems like he gets them out of plays that could get them in trouble. And he did that a number of times last night, even though they had some plays they got in trouble, he got them out of more than a few times. So yeah, he, he's the real deal, man. I, I just, I, I can't wait. I hate to say this like the fast forward, but I can't wait to see this guy when he's got like 12, 14 starts under his belt and he's had a whole year in the waking training and, and everything else. I, he's going to be amazing. Yeah, I thought it was really interesting. Illinois' plan seemed to be, hey, we're going to load up the box. We're going to try to make the freshman quarterback beat us. We're not going to let yep. you just run. We're not going to let you get into to second and medium, third and short. And for the most part, they were able to do that. I mean, Nebraska's running mm-hmm. game had a little success here or there. There was a couple times where a lane would open and Dante Dowdell was able to hit it. But for the most part, Illinois just kind of made Nebraska look like a pretty average to below average to bad at times running team. I, and some of that, um, some of that actually surprises me. I didn't think Nebraska was just going to be able to line up and roll over Illinois. But when both teams felt like, or, or when it was obvious Nebraska was going to run the ball, there just wasn't mm-hmm. much of a push there. You go look at those goal line situations. Third, and yeah. third you have Dante Dowdell have to do a pile jump in the middle of the field. <laughs> But he yeah. didn't. He had room to the left. He, had, he he runs at times where his eyes were closed. He had a, a, a hole to the left, and he decided, I'm just going to run to contact. Why yeah. does he constantly run to contact? Run to the open field. Gail Sayers said, give me six to eight inches. He's looking for six to eight players to run into. I mean, you've got to find the holes when they're there, and too many times he runs into contact. It, 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 I wanted. I thought Ramir Johnson should have played more. He had a, I think he made three or four carries. He should have played more. We didn't see any Emma Johnson at all, right. which kind of surprised me in terms of running the ball i dowdell has his moments and, and there are times for that kind of back i don't know if last night was that if you go back and you watch the kansas game go watch central michigan they made plays with some of their smaller backs i thought those guys should have played more i didn't love the rotation of running backs yes last night it's funny you say that about looking for contact because the one play that stands out to me where he truly tried to bounce something was the disastrous first down run on their final drive real yeah. drive of regulation the, the Scott's tackle. You end up missing uh, Lindemeyer. He bounces that to the outside where if he cuts it up and just grabs a, a few yards, mm-hmm. you may have had a first down on that. If everything plays out the same, you may have had a first down on that Jamal Banks catch the next play. And so right. instead, right. you're third and three, the Luke Lindemeyer play, you attempt the field goal. You know, so it's, it was one of those where I was a little bit, uh, a little surprised by how poor they were attempting to run the football. But at the same time, mm-hmm. Illinois really did have that box stacked. I mean, there were a lot of times they just had – you had the five-man front. You had seven guys in there. They basically said, all right, freshman quarterback, go beat us with your arm. And, I mean, he played well enough for them to be able to do that. They just couldn't play yeah. that area enough football. You know, I felt like – and I said going into the – into sort of the, the season, if Nebraska's defense was what it was, 24 points is probably going to be enough in, in nine or ten of your games this year. They got right. to 24. The defense just wasn't wasn't really good enough for, for them to win it. Yeah. 
in in regulation. I want to I want to talk about the receivers specifically. I thought this was, you know, and this isn't you know breaking news here. I thought this was the best game we've seen of Jamal Banks in sort of a oh, yeah. uh, impressive fashion. I mean, he had several really nice contested catches throughout the game. I mean, he doesn't mm-hmm. he's he's not going to be a guy who's going to have a thousand yards. He's probably not going to be a guy who has a you know a fifteen or excuse me a one hundred and fifty yard game or anything like that. But he can come up with some big catches for Nebraska in big moments. I, I was really impressed by Jamal Banks last night. Well, I think if anybody would have told you that your top receivers were going to have 12 catches for 184 yards or whatever they ended up having, uh, I think you're going to think that Nebraska is going to win that game because you think they're going to run the ball well enough. Right. Um, I, I like I, li- I love I love the way the wide receivers are set up. I, I think Isaiah Nair is a guy who is a real big play threat. You have to have that kind of guy, especially a physical threat. I think Jamal Banks, in terms of a possession receiver and the way he can work outside the numbers, I think that's awesome. To have a, a guy like Barney who can do – the Percy Harvin type who can do eight or nine different things for you, whether it's special teams or if it's uh, out of the run game or catching the ball or whatever he's doing. I think it's great. Um, And I think Jalen Lloyd is another thing where you just have a guy who can run your nine route, who can run your post. Uh, It's a good balance. The one, the one issue is, is I think that you have too much talent, the tight end position, not to be using it. Cause I'm going to add the tight end with the wide receivers, Uh, the middle of the field, when you're deciding to put five guys in the box or even bring six guys in the box, and you know you got to deal with those two big wide receivers. The middle of the field is where you've got to eat, right? And so they, they threw one to Carter Nelson that didn't work out because it was a little bit off on the pass. It should have been let him a little bit more. I know early on, Fadoni had a catch, but I don't know what's happened in the tight ends. And that, that should be a strength of your team. You're so deep, even down to Lindenmeyer, you know, and they're not using that enough. So I, I love where the wide receivers are. And I think they're going to get better. More reps they have with their quarterback. But they've got the Titans got to be more involved in the offense, in my opinion, especially if, if people are going to play defense the way Illinois played against Nebraska. Were you surprised in a game in which they're stacking the box that Nebraska ran as many deep routes as it did? It felt like they were looking to get down the field in big chunks, far more than you saw in terms of the quick passing game. Like it was a very, it was a very different sort of attacking plan than what we saw at other times this year. It didn't seem like there was a lot of get the ball out quick type plays or early options. And maybe it was just, maybe it was, it was just Raiola searching down the field. Yeah. Surprise, there was a little bit more quick game in there or quick options for him. Uh, then, then certainly, you know, if you go back and you look, and we have a wonderful view from the press box, a lot of deep ends, a lot of, you know, two options at least running 10, 15, 20 yards down the field on almost every passing play just didn't seem like there was a bunch of short outlets or quick throws or, or easy ways to take advantage of that stack box. Yep. And that's, and that's the tight ends, right? The tight ends and the running backs come into that. Um, I think if, if I'm thinking back and I haven't watched the full game back yet, but I think they only ran two screens um, coming into this. Yeah. I, I would guess Nebraska's run a dozen screens through the first three games. And we only saw two and, and one was kind of an inside play where real somehow managed to fit it in there. It was kind of an amazing throw that he got in there. But I, I think overall is that's what you're going to see. This is going to be a, and coach will have said it. This is a pro style NFL offense and NFL offenses push the ball down the field. That's what they do. They're going to take chances. If they get an interference call, that's great. If they get a catch. That's great. Um, and most times when you're throwing out to the numbers, you're not getting picked unless it's a short throw. So you, you look at what they're doing. Um, I think it's it's the part of the plan. Now, not having as many screens shocks me. Not having um, as much thrown to the tight end or the running back out of the backfield completely surprises me. Um, but the deep balls don't. I, I think that's going to be that's going to be a staple of the offense, especially when you got two six foot four wide receivers who can go get it. I think that's what they're going to try to exploit. Yeah, I I I agree that that's definitely where they they want to do things. I was just a little surprised they didn't have some alternatives at times. Especially, you know, again, felt like some of their second, third down plays, it's like you're trying to get that first down plus an additional 10 yards when sometimes you just mm-hmm. need a five-yard play. I mean, it's it was a it was an interesting thing that uh, just sort of felt like it bared out right away from the first quarter on. Let's dive over to special teams, an area yeah. where, uh, frankly, I, I don't understand how it looks like this every week. I really don't. Like, yeah. I, I don't know that there's any excuse for it. I don't understand how it looks like this under three different coaching staffs in a row. I don't, I, I'm at a loss for words. Like I, 
you know, we do all of this uh, content all off season long and we talk about what it's going to look like on offense and what it's going to look like on defense and all of these impact players and yada, yada, yeah. yada. And then occasionally we talk about special teams and usually it's just about the kicker and the punter and, and all of that. And those play a massive role and they did last night too. I simply don't understand some of the decision-making that they have going on over there. Like I don't, you know, I, I understand in theory what rule wants to do with some of the kickoffs and yet your coverage unit just has never been good enough to, to trust them to do that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and I just, you know, they finally at some point decided we're just going to put it in, into the end zone and eliminate that. But that was after you gave up a 30 yard return. I don't know what caused Brian Buscini to kick it to the wrong side of the field on the mm-hmm. deep punt, which is great. I mean, he absolutely bombed the ball. He's kicking the ball further this year, it feels like, mm-hmm. than he did last year. But their coverage unit, their gunners got their ass kicked last night. Mm-hmm. I don't know yeah. if you were watching that closely, but the ball would be in the air, and yep. Nebraska was nowhere near where they needed to be by the time the return man was catching it. I, I don't understand it. I don't know if that's an effort thing. I don't know if it's a scheme thing. <clears throat> Maybe Illinois is just really, really good in that aspect. You nailed that. Yep. Yep. And, you know, that's that's part of it. Nebraska continues to be the worst special teams team in a conference where it feels like every other team, or at least the 13 other teams before the new teams joined, emphasized it at a level that Nebraska was never near. And yeah. at some point that has to change. And we can talk about the kicking game and, and individual players and all of that. But some of it is Nebraska as a unit is just nowhere good enough for special players. Yeah. Yeah. It was it was my it was my biggest key. It was the biggest match mismatch coming into the game. Uh, oh, if, you the, if you just look at the basic rankings, just the basic rankings, right? Just go to ESPN efficiency rankings for special teams. It was a mismatch. Uh, they came in with a weapon that kicker, even their backup kicker, kicked a 59 yarder. They came in averaging 11 and a half yards a punt return. Their gunners are, their gun def- defense is amazing. I, I watched it in the Central Michigan game. I watched it against Kansas. It's what they do. They're really good at blocking that. Um, and then you look at their, their punter. Their punter has a great air yards. If you go back and look, he would have a great net, but his air yards are like 48 yards. So they're good. And then he, and then he throws the ball down at the two yard line late in the game to make Nebraska have to kneel on it. It was the biggest mismatch. I, I can't tell you why this is happening. I can't because there's too many people on this roster not to be able to find people to make a better special team. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense. And so we can look back in the years in the past when it wasn't good and we can say, well, they didn't emphasize it enough. They're emphasizing. They got a special teams coordinator. I know Matt Rule believes in it. No matter what level he's coached at, he's always had pretty good special teams. This is something that's a Nebraska thing. I don't know. You mentioned the Bushini kick, the punt going the wrong direction. That's a, that's like Michigan State when when they lost to that. Yeah. You, you got to kick it where your d- defense is, right? Then and and look, John Cole did his best. The man's never kicked in a game before. He made a twenty-one yarder. Uh, the ball's not quite. The laces aren't quite turned all the way. He hooks it. Chris Novano is, is growing is still bad. He he's in bad shape. I don't I don't know when he can play again. Um, but you, you have all of these things going wrong constantly in special teams. You can't say it's bad luck. You just can't because it's it's too many things consistently happening. And it was the biggest mismatch coming in this. You had offenses that were comparable, defenses that were comparable, and all the stat lines. But in special teams, Nebraska is. They were, they were 98th coming in the game in kickoff return yardage. Um, they were 102nd overall efficiency in special teams coming into the game. You, you can't do that and win in the Big Ten. I was proved that. If you're good at special teams, you're going to win games. If you're not, you're going to lose games. And I think special teams is a big reason why they lost last night. Oh, yeah. No, I, I mean, I think the defense didn't play well enough. I think the offense had moments where it could have it won the game outright. But the special teams, to me... It, we used to call it hidden yardage. It hasn't been hidden yes. for years. I mean, it hits you in the face. They have at least one loss in the last few seasons that are directly correlated to special teams. And I, I just I don't understand it. You mentioned Illinois had a, a backup kicker that hit a 59-yarder. Illinois has two kickers that played in the All-American Bowl. They had a backup <laughs> transfer from Texas A&M who came to Illinois and was fine being a backup behind another All-American kicker. And I, I don't say this to, to take any shot at, at John Hole. He's out there doing the best that he can. Nebraska's backup kicker hadn't kicked anywhere 
since 2022, and he had three field goal attempts in as a as a high school senior here locally in Lincoln. Right. You kind of left yourself in that situation, like you know, the, for having as big of a roster as you do, you had no other option going into the summer. I, I just well, they thought it would be Nico, right? They thought Adam Nelly was going to come in here. And and win the backup job, right? I mean, they had to. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, boom and leg. You watch him in pregame. He gets a sure. fifty-eight yarder in pregame, and it was up oh. into the top of the sticks. He's got a big leg, but uh, they don't obviously trust him in the game to not make him the backup kicker. Which is is just stunning. I I guess yeah. I I don't. I I'm just continually baffled. Like it just does not make sense to me that they are in this predicament that they are. And here's the thing, it doesn't get easier. You're you're only gonna play in this type of game really going forward. Right. And as we have seen, and one of the concerns, you know, and I was a guy who thought Nebraska was gonna have a nine and three season. I still think that's a possibility. Uh, you know, one of the losses I predicted was Purdue. So it's not like they're that far off track of where I'm at right now. Right. But one of the things that I said is that I wanted to see from last year. You lost a Minnesota game, close and late, questionable coaching decisions. Yeah. Couldn't get a stop when you needed to get off the field. Maryland, Wisconsin, Iowa, they're all the same type of game. Last night felt very similar in some respects in the fourth quarter that when you needed to make plays, you weren't able to make plays. When your defense needed to get off the field, you couldn't slow down a quarterback. You couldn't stop the wide receiver. You couldn't stop the running backs. There's just – there is a concern of mine that Nebraska doesn't know how to finish games, that their coaching staff doesn't put them in position to finish some of these games. And then in areas where they're deficient or have been deficient for a while, like special teams, they still seem deficient. Like I, there is enough concern that I have coming out of this game where it's not as simple as, Hey, you know, Nebraska ran against a team that was a little bit better on a Friday night, a ranked team in Illinois. And Mm -hmm. you just tip your cap to them you move on and you continue to do your work, you know, that's, that's ultimately what they have to do. And yet I'm sitting here thinking, is this all that different than the Wisconsin game last year? Is this all that different than, you know, the, the score is different. The overall play is different. You have a five-star quarterback who's fantastic. That's different. And yet you look up when it's zero, 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 your team lost in overtime, never challenged, never threatened to score. Couldn't put the game away. I, I just, there's some real concern here that they sort of are stuck in this grind where, you know, Matt rule wants to be a fourth quarter team. And yet in big 10 games in the fourth quarter, they lose. And that didn't get better yesterday. And so yeah. wonder if that's a real trend and if they can get off of that Schneid. Uh, if I'm making headlines for Tuesday night, big red wrap up, one of the Chirons is going to say deja vu all over again. Because it feels exactly the same. What I, you were a little bit farther away from me yesterday, so I couldn't hear you. What were you saying at the end of the half? As the clock was ticking down, Nebraska had three timeouts and they weren't using them. It, it felt, didn't it feel very similar to 2023 when they weren't very good at clock management? Now it worked out. Dylan Rowland made a great throw to the sideline, got him in position. It worked out. But that was not the way you run your two minute drill. Not when you have three timeouts. It doesn't make any sense to do that. I know you don't want to leave time for Illinois to the half. I completely get that. Your number one goal is to score, though. And they were letting the clock bleed down. He doesn't make that throw or a great throw to the corner to the sideline. All of a sudden, you're you're stuck there. And you got a long field goal opportunity. So I, I, I don't know if Matt Rule has somebody specifically set aside for clock management or making sure that when they need to call timeouts, but that needs to be hired. They've got 900 people on staff. Somebody needs to be the person to do that. And I don't think they have the capability among the offensive coordinator, whoever else is running it and Matt rule to make those calls. Cause we obviously didn't see it again at the end of the first half. So yeah, I worry about that, but it, it is, it feels exactly the same as it's felt like last year, the coach before that it's, it's Nebraska having to make plays. And when, they go back and they write a, a documentary on Nebraska's overtime struggles over the course of a decade. Th- there'll be experts from NASA trying to figure out exactly how this could possibly happen because it statistically it's improbable that you don't get a first down through eight different overtimes. It's it, not a field goal, nothing. It is impossible for that to happen. And Nebraska is managing to do it. And, and, and they had, what did they have? Was it third and 29, third and 39, yeah. whatever that yeah. was, that's third impossible as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's impossible. 
I think they were already bordering towards negative yardage before last night in overtime. So it's oh, overtime. Yeah. And they were because of the Colorado and Northwestern where they lost giant chunks of yards. So, you know, that only compounds it. They're going to need multiple overtimes just to get back into positive yard territory, possibly, uh, which yeah. is, is something special. Yeah, so the end of the first half, I guess I rationalized it in my brain that Illinois was going to get the ball. You wanted to take as much time off. You're at the 11-yard line, which is, you know, right. that throw he made to Nair. It felt like they were at the 25 or the 30, just the way that there is so much space between where he threw that ball and, and where Nair caught it. But they were at the 11. So it felt yeah. like they they would have had enough time to run more plays if they needed to. But, yeah, it was, it's been curious. I mean, the, the decision to – to challenge that mm. out of bounds, yeah. that right. was curious, and you know he's got a guy for that. They have a they have a replay coordinator. I hope so. But <laughs> well, I, I'm pretty sure they do. I think they have someone listed in their guide. Is that and I could be mm. wrong there? But the other the other thing is what's the sort of what was the purpose of getting those three yards back? And first and goal from the six, or first and goal from the three. Right. I guess the, to me, the value of the timeout is significantly more than the three yards there. So it was, mm -hmm. there's some stuff there with Matt Rule where I get a little hesitant that the in game isn't good enough on the sidelines, which is why I feel like the Scott Frost failure or, or occurred. He was a terrible head coach relative to the conference that you go against. I think Matt Rule is a lot mm -hmm. better in a lot of respects. Uh, than, than Scott Frost in terms of in-game management. But clock management's a concern. Um, mm -hmm. And really, sometimes the fourth quarter pulse, like figuring out how you want to, how aggressive you want to be. You know, do you want to get after him? Do you want to play back? Do you want to push the ball? Now, with the quarterback that they have, it seems like they're going to be a lot more aggressive than they were last year. But sure. I just, until they start to win two, maybe even three of these fourth quarter type games, it's hard to feel confident if the score is tied going into the final frame that Nebraska is going to come out on top. They just haven't given you reason to think that in recent years. I mean, when they've won games, it's largely because they've been able to put teams away and then keep away in the fourth quarter. That's what they did all of the They're one in six. Over. They're, they're yeah. one in six in one score games over the last year. Yeah. And their one, their one win, their one win was uh, Illinois, right? On the Friday yeah. night. Yeah. Yep. And even yep. that yeah. one, that, they had 55 opportunities to win that game by two scores, and they just kept fumbling late. Yeah, they're, they've gotten points. I was thinking about this drive at home. In the Big Ten specifically, there are things you have to do to win games, especially when you're going against the old Big Ten West teams because they all do it well. And the biggest one is obviously win special teams, as we said. Um, but clock management's huge, too, because so many of the games come down to the end. So you got to be able to be good at that. Kurt Ferentz was horrible at it for most of his career and then said, you know, I got to get help. Actually went out and got help. This is four or five years ago. And it, it really changed the way they started winning close games. The other thing you have to do is you got to be able to stop the run when they want to run it. And you got to be able to run it when they know you're running it. And Nebraska yesterday physically couldn't do those last two things. Uh, I, I will say, to give Matt Rule a little credit, I thought he handled the timeout situation at the end of the game correctly. I know there's some people, even the TV crew, from what I heard when I was rewatching the end of the game, um, they wanted him to just let it play out. I think you call your timeouts there. You force them to make the first down, and then if you can leave yourself with 30 seconds with Dylan Raiola, I'm going to give myself a chance. So I actually thought that was good, even though they criticized him. But overall, that's one of the few times where I thought when it came to clock management that, he, that his crew did a good job. Yeah, the only thing that I wasn't sure on, and we were discussing it up in the press box, so the few people that were left, the, the timeout right before the final pass that Illinois had on third down, mm -hmm. if that was just, you're calling that after you let all that time run off just because you wanted to see the personnel, I thought at that point maybe you just hold on to that timeout because if they get in a situation where Illinois, we talked about it, they kicked a 59-yarder the week before, like if yeah. they would have picked up like, five yards there they're probably attempting to go for the win i think at that point if you still yeah, have your time out and they miss it you get the ball in that spot you have an opportunity for one play and who knows if you can kick a field goal from that far but at least you would have given yourself an opportunity there it does feel like they just wanted to see what illinois was going to do personnel wise with that last yeah game. 
In college football, you don't necessarily, in college football, it's so different because you don't necessarily need to save timeouts for your offense because of the fact that the clock stops after first downs right. and the ability with the wide hashes to be able to get out of the bounds easier than NFL. But I, I understand what you're saying. I, I thought they needed eight more yards to legitimately attempt a field goal. Remember, you were kicking in a direction where it was hard to get the ball in the end zone all night. So it would have taken a little bit more, I think, to make that kick. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. Michael, do you coming off of this game? Does does anything you saw last night change sort of your season overall projection as to where you think Nebraska is going to finish? I don't. I I want to say you were seven and five or or six eight and, six and four. In that range. I was eight at eight. Four. I was at eight and four. Eight and four. Eight and four. And I had this down as a win. Um, I thought Friday night, the emotions and everything, and it was, God, it was, again, I, talk, I told you before this, I talked to a couple of uh, parents and I talked to a couple of players, and, and they both said it wasn't Colorado, but it was as close to Colorado in terms of the sound and, and the emotion in the stadium. So that was incredible. I thought that was something that would carry Nebraska over. Um, and I worried a little bit about Purdue like you did because you had a freshman quarterback going on the road for the first time, and that's not easy to do. Um, I knew Indiana would be good. I knew UCLA would be bad. I'm a little surprised at how bad you see, uh, Wisconsin is. So maybe we balance that out. I still think they can get to eight and four. I do, mm -hmm. but you got a lot to clean up and health wise. So now Turner Corcoran, based off of what it looked like when he was leaving the field, he's probably out. I thought Gunnar Gatula. I, I watched him specifically for two straight drives. <clears throat> Excuse me. I watched him two straight drives, and he actually did a really good job. They gave him some help, but he did well. So maybe they're okay there. Um, I don't know about Tommy Hill. Plantar fasciitis is something that's reoccurring. You know, I mean, that just doesn't go away. Um, so we'll see how that goes. Uh, but I, I, I still feel pretty good about eight and four. Um, I still think going to Iowa at the end is going to be a really tough game. And I think going out to USC is going to be a really tough game. But everything outside of that in Ohio State are, are winnable games. You've just got to get off of one in six in Warren score games since 2023. You got to win one of those. And maybe we win one of those. All of a sudden, you feel more like a winner. I asked Co Coach Rule this in the Big Red wrap-up interview we did. I said, how do you convince guys who have seen nothing but losing and tough losses in close games that they can win those games? And he said, you have to win them. That's the only way. I can tell them it all over, over and over, but they have to win them. And they haven't done that yet. So uh, I, I, mean, I am concerned a little about that, about the winning or losing mentality that builds into you when you're doing things like this. Yeah, I, I, think, that's, I think that's spot on. I, I do feel like, in a weird way, the Purdue game now feels like kind of a nice spot for Nebraska. This is a Purdue team that's going out to Oregon State. They're playing there today here on Saturday. Do you think they win that? There. I don't think they're going to beat Oregon State, no. God, I think they bounce back today. You do? I, 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 I really – I don't know why, but I feel I feel they bounce back. I think – yeah, I I think the Notre Dame, game, Notre Dame game was an anomaly. They just ran up against a team that – that lost to a Northern Illinois and, and they came out for vengeance. I, I, I kind of feel like they do. Maybe they don't, but I, I think Purdue bounces back this week. We'll and see. I'm not going to profess to know exactly how Oregon State's going to attack anybody, but Notre Dame ran They're gonna run the ball. over 300 <laughs> yards against Purdue. I know. So I, know. I sort of I look at it for Nebraska like, look, I'm not expecting 300 yards, but I think 170, if you can go 170 with the sort of passing offense that you have, Nebraska should be right. okay. In West right. Now, first road game for Dylan Raiola, and I think that's going to be really interesting uh, yeah. to, to note that by itself. But if you get that win out in West Lafayette, and let's say that they do, that yeah. Rutgers game, I think, is going to be oh. a, a very, very similar game to mm -hmm. what you just played against Illinois. And you're going to get without a better game. quarterback, without a good quarterback. Right. They don't have a good quarterback. Yeah, that's that's the difference. Yeah. Well, they're they're going to be good and in on special teams they're going to make mm -hmm. you earn every inch with their defense and their offense is going to i i think it's a little more creative uh in in how they do things and than what you might remember for for Rutgers. Yeah. but they're uh to me that feels kind of like a redo game and i want to see what you know i don't want to skip the purdue game but i'm already mm -hmm. mentally like i want to see nebraska against Rutgers to see what they learn from this mm -hmm. week how they're going to go about things against a team that uh is, is going to challenge them in a lot the same way that, that Illinois does. I, I got one last question yeah. for you. Yeah, 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 sure. And I don't know um, – I don't know – I can pull up their schedule here too. Illinois winning this game, does does that change how you sort of view Illinois? Do you think this is a team that – I thought they were 6-6. Six and six. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I did That's too. I thought they were going to be a very middle-of-the-pack team. 
Mm-hmm. Is it possible that they end up, you know, like I think Illinois is better than Wisconsin. I think Illinois is better than Minnesota oh, yeah. and Northwestern. Yeah. I think Illinois versus Iowa is probably a toss up, to be honest. Yeah. I, I don't right. I don't really think that highly of Iowa this year. I think they are what they are. But today we'll find out. Teams. Yeah. Today, today we'll find out. out. That Minnesota Iowa game is gonna be a rock fight. Absolute rock fight. I want to watch zero seconds of that game. I mean, really? Oh man! I mean, We're going to the sports myself. bar to watch that game specifically. Why? Because oh, no. I I, I want to watch it. I think it means so much to Nebraska's future. I is Minnesota. Minnesota might be real. You don't know. They got a really good defense. They can move the ball. Iowa. What are they? I mean, this is going to be. Maybe I'm. Maybe I'm stuck in old Big Ten West. Got to know what it's like. But I want to. I want to watch that game. I really do. I'm kind of excited to see what they're going to. I picked eighteen seventeen Iowa. Classic Big Ten West game. I watched Minnesota North Carolina finish, and I said yeah. to myself, "I don't have to watch another Minnesota game <laughs> this year." <laughs> okay, and they are the exact team that they have been in recent years. They right. are up there as one of the least fun college football teams in a in a sport that usually has so much going for it in terms of wackiness yeah. and and creativity and unique offenses or fun defenses or exciting players. Minnesota has none of that. They don't have a single interesting thing to me about this team. And I, I, I'm like so blown away by where they are as a program, considering who PJ Fleck is and how he presents himself, that they're this bland mm-hmm. on offense. I just don't, I don't want to watch it. Like, it, that's why he wanted to leave. Ugly. That's why he wanted to leave. That's why he tried oh, to get the UCLA job. That's why. Yeah. That's why. That's why he tried to leave. But but they are a team that what they do probably gets. You don't think they get to seven wins? I think Minnesota can. I just don't know that I yeah. want to watch any of those games. Right. That's, that's <laughs> yeah. So by the way, Illinois. I pulled it up. Illinois plays number ten Penn State. Number yeah. currently eighteen Michigan. Number nine Oregon. And then they finish with a gauntlet of a bunch of physical teams in Minnesota, Michigan State, and Rutgers. So, I mean, I don't know. I, I, six and six is what I thought, but that's a pretty tough schedule. Wow. I, I think Illinois can go beat Michigan. I wouldn't be surprised if Michigan struggles big time against USC today. That Michigan offense has looked bad um, even before the Texas game. So I'll, we'll we'll see kind of how Michigan looks against USC. That game I will be watching. Here, they're going to run all quarterback power. That's a quarterback power game. They bring Orgy in. They're not going to be throwing the ball a lot. Um, USC with well, Dan Lynn has been really good defensively. But are you ready to? Lo- are they ready to line up against a Big Ten offensive line and a Big Ten run game? We're going to see. I people are picking USC to blow them out. Uh, I think Michigan stays in that game just because of what they can do physicality wise today. Well, I think they can shorten the game. I think they can make it harder oh, yeah. for USC to go run away with it. I just yeah. wonder if if USC can put up enough points, are they just going to be safe? Because I don't know. Even if you're running a bunch of quarterback power, unless you're getting giant chunks of it, mm-hmm. I just don't know that Michigan can put up that many points. And then when the field gets small, yeah, I, you know, I think they're going to be settling for a lot of field goals. So then you're going to be yeah. trading three versus potentially six for for USC. So. Uh, well, I took the under in that game because of that. I bet the under today yeah, in that oh, game yeah. specifically because of that. I thought that they'll slow it down enough. Yeah, definitely. And, and one last thing about Rutgers, because you mentioned that. I ran into a, I have a friend of mine who works for the the pyrotechnics group. Um, and he went to Rutgers. And he's a huge Rutgers fan. He knows everything about Rutgers. And he, he, I'm walking by him and he goes, if Nebraska's run defense is like that against Rutgers, they're running for 250. That's what he said. He said they're running for 250 if they, 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 if they tackle like that, if they allow – that kind of stuff to happen, especially inside. He said they're going to run for 250 yards on them. And I, well, I can see that being the same thing. That's the best individual running back they would have faced all year, too. Um, I can't think of his name, yeah. but he's he's quite good. And so that, like I said, yeah. I don't want to skip past the Purdue game. And certainly, I know, I know, I know. The capability of losing it, but it feels like they get a do over against Rutgers. And if they don't learn anything from coming out of this week against Illinois, they're going to lose this type of game again at home against Rutgers on, uh, I believe, October 5th. I think that's the date. So, all right, Michael. Hey, I appreciate uh, your time, as always. Thanks for joining us here on the Sunday side session. Uh, you have a you have an actual Sunday show. Today's just Saturday. We're, we're yeah. one day early. Where can people get yeah. more Michael Severe? 
Yeah, so it's severe delayed reaction when we do the Sunday show after a Friday game, but it's it's on sixteen twenty the zone in Omaha and online, of course. Eight to ten, uh, we do severe reaction and um and, and usually I'm scrambling to try to watch half the game on the way home and the other half and having to do everything and try to get up at four o'clock in the morning and not get any sleep. So this is gonna be nice to actually be arrested Sunday morning doing the show. Here you go. It should be yeah. very insightful. You you'll probably have watched the game like five times by that point. Really <laughs> I do plan on right after this. I plan on watching it right now. I plan on turning on the rest of it because I do want to hear Tim Brando's call. Tim, Tim Brando is the, the voice of my childhood. I don't know if you know this. Tim Brando was a young sportscaster in Louisiana when I was growing up. And so I've been listening to Tim Brando since I was like 10 years old. So I'm looking forward to, to listening to that. My message board was less than kind to, to Tim Brando. And I believe it. <laughs> I, uh, I believe it. Yeah, I just did. You fascinated your reaction there. <laughs> All right, everybody, be sure yeah. to stop by Husky 24-7, plenty of coverage coming off of that game. BC Brunch writing up everything. We've got all your post-game analysis. We'll have more coverage throughout the weekend as well. Get over to Husker247.com.